Welcome back. This is uh, Franz Cantor, um, illustrator, cartoonist, and tune talker, teacher, tinker, tailor, spy, you name it. Um, here back again. I'm um, actually doing another caricature today, and uh, the character that I'm going to do, I've just done a little thumbnail of him, uh, just to work out some rough shapes. He's got quite, he has little sparse hair, so that just, just means that the shape is unobstructed. Um, and he has glasses. So it's kind of like an egg shape, I guess, um, that we're trying to uh, establish. Um, Shadow-wise, it's a sort of from a, a picture which is a flash lit. So, but I think basically the, high, the lights are coming in from the uh, left-hand side, so you'll get shadows on the, uh, the bottom right-hand side of the picture. Okay, so the subject, without further ado, is uh, this fellow here, which you may or may not recognize. This is before he has a beard. This is, of course, Mike Mignola, the father of Hellboy. So uh, let's uh, make some room here and go through some of these uh, pictures. We'll start at the, uh, the base. First one, not him. That's, we're going to do him tomorrow, Carl Barks. So Hellboy, this is the Hellboy universe. Um, very interesting character. There's some very key elements um, in, in uh, Mignola's work. One is that the, he has this innate sense of storytelling, this incredible thirst for knowledge, all about you know, legends and mythology and um, uh, it, it's sort of incredible sense of composition and staging and you know, he's a really uh, uh, an artist who hones his craft within the graphic novel medium or the comic book medium. And uh, I've never seen anything uh, quite as uh, pronounced as this. He has a very unique sense of story as well. And the way that he tells his story is in sort of a truncated form of, you know, uh, dialogue, very much like the uh, style of, um, uh, you know... Uh, um, Maltese Falcon or, or something like that. You've got these two-fisted heroes and, um, and they get into scraps and, and they get out of, of these scraps not so much with their wit but just by circumstance, by accident or by, you know, their physicality. So um, he's kind of a hero but he's also an anti-hero. This is Hellboy, of course. There's a cast of other characters that he's, he comes up with. As I said, he, he loves history. You know, there's a, there's a sort of a universe of, that, of creations that he's sort of dabbled into. Of course, there's Abe Sapien and um, Lobster Johnson and uh, the uh, perennial um, uh, Baba Yaga and uh, um, um, Rasputin. <laughs> so, and, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting universe he's created a world and you know we're going to talk about Karl Barks I hope tomorrow but uh, there's another person that's created a world this is the exciting thing about art and about comic characters um, and illustration you have a chance of of creating a character but you create a character inside a world so the, the world that you create is something completely of your own imagination and this is true of, of Hellboy. And uh, indeed, you know, this is the Witchfinder. So all of the characters that Mike, this is Mike, a uh, more recent one of him with a, with a um, sporting a, a beard. And a uh, very, very interesting um, artist, very interesting man indeed. This is some of his latest works, uh, illustration works. So he has an innate sense of, of composition and design, like a great graphic designer, combined with a sense of play and a sense of investigation into the mediums. This is like watercolour. This is some of his other works, Ape Sapien, uh, The Amazing Screw on Head, you know, um, Mr. Higgins Comes Home. There's, there's a beautiful, there's a sense of Hitch, Hitchcock as well 
and uh, you know film noir and the history of cinema and it's just so many things that interests Mike Mignola and it shows in every brushstroke. That's what's fascinating because by studying him and by studying his work, you get really an appreciation for you know all of these wonderful um, investigative properties uh, of of the process of, of of illustrating his ideas. This is his version. These are quite new. This is his version of of pop culture. This is Kermit the Frog, <laughs> designed by by Mignol. It's a beautiful uh, watercolor. This is sort of a a, a robot a robotic. Uh, uh, Batman variant, you know, variation. You could see he's not afraid, you know, antennas and wings. He's not afraid to twist and turn the um, the character and create something that is bona fide and unique in the narrative. He creates his own narratives. They beg stories to be told about these characters. You know, even ca- seemingly uh, an innocent looking character. This is from his Twitter feed. These are little sketches of, of things of whimsy. This is like a pelic- uh, a, a cormorant or a pelican or something, you know, um, as, a, as, a, as a, a, a personality. But even then, you know, the, it looks like an opera coat or something like this, smoking a cigarette. So it has a place and time. It, it evokes a world. This is this is what he does. He evokes the world. There's another smoking birds, and look at the uh, beautiful crosshatch. You know the the intricate weave to build up tone. Right. We're going to try to experiment a little bit of that uh, in the drawing today. This is beautiful. And I love the, the 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 ins and outs of the contours. How he is able to create this sort of gnarly uh, effect. And it just suits it very well. I mean, this is like a Monsters, Inc. Uh, version of, of him. You can see everything is there. He's, he's, he's made it his own, in his own um, investigation, his own study. Incredible. Really cool stuff. This is Robo Monsters. This is a, a, from a, a movie in the 1950s. <clears throat> but again, you know, it has his unique... Um, sense of style, but look at the cross hatching in the shadows over there, the way he's built up, he's put nipples on the monkey suit as well. So it's great, um, great, uh, in, you know, composition and sense of balance and light and shade modeling. Metaluna Mutant from, um, from uh, this island Earth, you know, uh, 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 quite an ugly looking design for an alien, but again, you know. <laughs> create this this believability within a world that can quite easily, you know, uh, uh, exist. Beanie and Cecil. This is something from um, the 1950s, the puppet show of, uh, from America in the 1950s, and of course the um, uh, the cartoon show uh, that was um, uh, Chuck Jones. Beautiful hand puppet. <clears throat> this is a, a, a color version of his Batman robot. You know, it's just the the level of. Uh, I really love his work. I love his work. I love the way he thinks. This is uh, a, a later picture of him. Okay, so let's go back to the the one unsporting the beard and uh, see if we can delve into his uh, personality a little bit as we go. I've taken the liberty. Of transforming him, of just sketching the, the the pencil study up onto a um, onto the toned paper. I've just actually realised that um, it might be worthwhile extending the frame a little bit because I think that the um, the composition might might benefit from it. Um, then maybe let's go for it anyway let's try it anyway we'll try and have the ear I like things that overlap you know the the framing device here Um, it's kind of cool so we'll kind of leave it we'll shave a little bit off on the right and uh, we'll see how far we can make this work or not work 
it may not work, you know. Anything could happen in the next half hour. So Mike Mignola, I loved his work. Uh, I came upon his, um, his work, of course, in the Hellboy magazine and um, The Right Hand of Doom. And, of course, he's been in many movies, which I also uh, love, and cut and uh, animated, two animated uh, movies. So I am a fan of his stuff and a fan of the, of the brand... Of Brand Hellboy. So I love the, the... I don't like reading. I don't believe that in a visual medium like a comic you should rely too much on, on the, visual, on the um, written narrative because it's presuming too much from the reader. It's kind of t saying, oh, um, this, the, you know, this, this story is so complex, so difficult... Um, we've written words to explain it so that, um, you know, you don't like, you don't have to look at the pictures. I, I think it's kind of insulting in a way to have a, a comic that, uh, that relies too much on words. So, you know, the comics that I respond to are very, very short narratives, very, very short narratives, kind of like the... Um, Captain America in, um, you know, the olden days in the 60s with uh, um, Roy Thomas and Stan Lee and, and uh, Kirby at the helm. So Kirby, of course, is a big influence on, um, on Mignola uh, in many ways, not just the style of the pen work. I mean, he has a sense... Mignola has a very much more... Um, organic feel to the curves of the characters so that they have this sort of gritty um, uh, lived-in look very much to his style you know and a few studios like Disney uh, have put out of obviously Atlantis tried to emulate his style for the benefit of the um, of the film that he that he um, designed and you know they try to sort of get a handle on his visual his visual methodology visual storytelling uh technique i'm going to try to keep some sharp um angles in here there's one other thing with uh uh working or looking at his work is of course he, he adores these sharps these sharp angles and Reminiscent of Kirby, of course. Kirby used to love sharps as well, but Kirby had a had a different um, pen technique, and um, uh, we we can talk about that later. There's a video of, uh, I did of um, Jack Kirby, which goes into that a little bit of his mythology and uh, you know the beautiful way that that he. Um, Created a like a, a universe, the, the Kirby universe, but definitely um, something worth looking into. Uh, you'll find that uh, in the YouTube list. And uh, those of you that are viewing this on uh, Facebook today, um, it's in. It just go to my YouTube channel. Just go to Franz Cantor. Uh, F-R-E-N-T-Z-K-N-T-O-R, that's me. And uh, I'll check out the the Kirby, um, Jack Kirby video drawing I did. So uh, there's something funny. I want to talk about this. This is, uh, we must talk about. Let's talk about this. What is this? What does this mean? This is a French window. <laughs> it is. It is a French window. I'm going to, re I'm, Sorry, I'm going to remove it. The idea of this is a comical uh, device to put in to show um, something that's shiny. You create a reflection, and the comical response comes from um, the author of Beetle Bailey, the comic book, uh, the comic strip. And I can't remember the name of this device, but um, it's definitely a French window. So it's like this window 
re window reflector because window is a source of light, right? So just instead of just doing a round, nondescript shape, it puts in a little um, shape like that, which is indicative of, of a French window, just to give you a, 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 an idea of uh, a world outside of the, of the uh, object of the picture. It's like a studio, it's sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a funny little device and I've always loved it because um, in a world where we take ourselves too seriously, you know, with art, it's, good, it's, a, good, it's a good thing to, to not to take yourself too seriously, yeah. So looking for lines, and uh, again, you know, the, the whole idea of this is uh, oh, these little angry caterpillars over here, we have to feed them with uh, the right pencil strokes so that they're not sort of angry, but more in line with, uh, with the shapes that we're trying to do. I might use this one, one point too. This is nice, isn't it? I wonder how effective that is. Oh, that's pretty good. Um, so, uh, angry caterpillars, yeah, no, we're, we're, angry caterpillars, of course, is just referring to the eyebrows. <laughs> it's just, uh, cause they're f fuzzy and they, it's, it's like this, right? So the angry caterpillars mean that their, their heads, which is over in this direction, um, they argue sometimes over the nose, <laughs> right? And um, the angrier that uh, they get, the more spiky they get. A little joke, very little. Um, so let's talk about the process here uh, before we go any further. I'm putting in a little crown here because it's like one of these elements. He, he loves to use these graphic elements which changes and mixes the visual narrative quite a lot kind of um uh it's 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 a very unique thing to do it's a sort of steps you out of the story momentarily to create a sense of importance and uh um uh, like a like a exclamation mark in a sentence you know, so it's something that you have to um, take into account when you read a Hellboy comic. It's not all going to be um, what you think it is as a normal comic. It's going to have a very unique uh, visual, um, compelling uh, uh, um, narrative. And it's almost like a form of instructions on how to, how best to read this this character, or how best to read this story. That's nice things. I'm going to get this French window coming in here. Um, I don't want those lines though. I don't want the that line to be too strong. So we'll have to we'll work that out. We're working with a brown pencil and a white pencil and a black pencil. And oh, there's a black pencil. When they get stubby, you put little holders on them. It extends the handle. So the brown pencil is a uh, Prismacolor terracotta. White pencil is a Prismacolor white. And the black is a Faber-Castell black. Okay. And, of course, the paper is a, brown, is a toned gray paper by Strathmore. Um, it's just a nice, smooth untextured paper that can take quite a lot of uh, pencil line. Okay, so let's uh, continue on. Um, we're trying to get some shapes here. There's some very distinctive shapes. Obviously, his face is dissected in many ways by, by, the, by the glasses. Um, we're going to try to cope with that. There's a very strong um, aquiline nose, for those that have read Dracula. Aquiline nose... Um, is a term that uh, Bram Stoker coined for Dracula in the titular novel Dracula. Not Dracula, Prince of Darkness, but just Dracula. So um, it just means that it's uh, very um, distinctive and 
European looking, yeah, perhaps. D kind of denotes, you know, um, uh, royalty or, or something like that, whatever he was trying to allude to in the, um, in the book. Of course, um, Mignola did a uh, comic of the, the Francis Ford Coppola version of uh, of Dracula very ve and that's in his earlier uh, p part of his career as well so I think it was even before before Hellboy could be um, I can't remember when Dracula was I think it was 93 so he's been around a long time um, has um, Mike and uh, a very interesting, uh, very interesting man. I believe he got the the gig or the story because he was just at the right place at the right time. And uh, they obviously knew that he was talented and could do the work. But it's a very ambitious. Uh, <laughs> his story is incredibly ambitious. Hellboy. You know, because it's creating a, a very intricate um, universe populated by mythological um, beings that interact with a Bureau of Investigation. So it's sort of like the FBI for spooks. So, um, and they also attract a lot of uh, people, a lot of agents who have special abilities and powers like Abe Sapien who is a, um, uh, a, 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 a like a fish man he's like the gill man like a, a creature from the Black Lagoon but he's more sort of gentlemanly and sentient um, and apparently very old he doesn't sort of say how old he is but he's called Abe Sapien because he was found apparently um with the date, the internment date in a tank of uh, the year President Lincoln died in the 1860s or 70s, whatever it was. So it's, uh, you know, these strange um, uh, designs, these strange... Well, the designs are kind of like his penchant for... Um, for character design, which is kind of like, there's a little bit left up to the imagination. It's not fully fleshed out. Uh, and certainly Hellboy wasn't fully fleshed out at, at first. You know, that came later. That came with more investigation. So that's the thing also, you know, the level of um, study, of, of investigation. In, oh, that's a nice uh, shape there on the nose. The level of investigation really um, is quite deep, and even for the mythology that he touches upon in the stories, you know, um, we haven't heard before, like, you know, the Baba Yaga, which is a Russian fairy tale, Russian mythology, and these are not something that you kind of grow up with, uh, usually, I did, but, you know, most people know. I was very interested in uh, mythology. So I, I responded very well to um, these stories that I could recognize from um, elements that I'd seen before and was very curious as to how they would play a, play a part and how um, relevant they would be to, the, to both the, you know, the characters, the setting of, the, of Hellboy and uh, also... The um, uh, one moment, one second. Also, the fact that um, how much investigation did he do, and how much does he have to change for the narrative that he's working on? So this is kind of a give and take, isn't it? But thankfully, a lot of these myths and legends have variants, don't they? So you know, I mean, there's there's a quite a a, a, a diverse mythology or a variation of, of mythological uh, stories because most of them 
let's face it, like Greek myths and things, they're kind of like Aesop's fables in a way. They're, they're little um, lessons that teach mankind um, not to mess with nature. Oops. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's interesting how he was able to um, use these, these characters, these devices, to add to the universe of Hellboy. So Hellboy had this incredibly rich um, tapestry of, uh, of ideas and concepts and the world to make sense of, you know, um, and that also made him interesting because you never knew what you would get. You always had this ability that it could turn up anywhere, even in Mexico. It was a beautiful comic uh, drawn by uh, Richard Corbin. We'll, we'll talk more about Richard Corbin another day, but... Um, you know, it was uh, an incredible, uh, powerful narrative and, of course, added so much more to the, um, to the myth mythology of Hellboy as a whole, right? Um, because he had all these travels, right? So, the, you, you, you know, there'd be BPRD 1956, BPRD 1957, the whole of the 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 genres he would explore uh, mythology and and um, legends and things from from all over the world you know Japan for example some beautiful uh, evocative um, tales there because um, Japanese myths and legends and horror stories if you look at at the um, at the uh, 1960s films uh, from Japan, you know, they were so, oh boy, uh, and even horror, horror comics today, you know, there's some great uh, examples of, um, of horror stories, very, very evocative. So there, you had this incredible world that was flexible and pushed and pulled against science and against technology and against the mythology and religions and beliefs and, and cultures and things like that. So it was quite rich and um, even bigger than the, 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 the story of Hellboy himself, you know, which was the, I think he was like the, the, um, the creature of the Armageddon, the, the beast of the Armageddon, which is like his own uh, story. So it's kind of these re semi-religious stories built on... Um, on the on these characters and in Hellboy's case all of the characters actually they have they have this poignant humanity to them where they have a choice of actually being victims to their own story their own the, the written narrative or create their own relevance their own narrative you know and many, and and that's part of the humanity that uh that he touched upon this man touched upon that so the, the characters had an incredible humanity to them. All of the characters, the baddies, the goodies, there was no such thing as, uh, you know, it wasn't two-dimensional. So within the style, which was fairly uh, structured and uh, stylized, right, you had this incredible multi-layered um, uh, characters, character stories with and a lot of them had incredible backstories as well, you know. And oftentimes you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you you didn't know what the backstory was, but you just sensed that there was a big backstory, like Ape Sapien or um, um, Lobster Johnson or something, you know. And it, it, he would just tease you with with um, episodes about how it's looking very gandhi like here about how they um how their stories interwoven into the bigger picture the tapestry that he was drawing that he was painting and drawing and telling so it's a very powerful um 
storytelling method to be like to have this responsibility to create a world that people could explore in many ways like you know like a game multi-layered game so the ideas that he he exposed um the character the, you know with the characters and the situations whether or not they're resolved they could be sort of truncated they could be like little notes almost in a tra- like a traveler's journal um this is another form of 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 keeping it true to the character himself you know because hellboy was sort of a like a gypsy would go from case to case and could find himself on a plane to switzerland and you know one minute and then shanghai the next you know so it could be anywhere anywhere who go where there are spooks <laughs> um so it had that that uh, sort of i don't know scooby doo um flexibility of any any ghost so he kind of likes scooby doo is like a ghostbuster in a way but he was himself hellboy was sort of like a a mythological uh, character uh you know the beast of the armageddon after all but so i'm trying to build up a bit of uh um contrast here with the tone so i'm conscious that uh we've got a lot of um you know what i need to establish uh, rather than doing a highlight at the top which i i think might not be that appropriate i i need to get some kind of texture in here i know he's got a shaved head in this photograph so he's very sh- very short hair um and um but that just means that there is a texture ultimately in the hairline so i need to get that back i need to refer back to that i think that would be good you know you have this sort of widow's peak effect happening here which is kind of a nice texture which i can get with the uh the pencil so um yeah his storytelling methods uh you know I'm a big fan of his and um obviously it's favored visual uh it's favored to a visual storytelling um uh methodology and the the visual storytelling is very it's like shorthand uh which is the same as the narrative the written narrative so the written narrative stories very sort of truncated and shorthand and and short form so that there's a lot left up to the reader to uh make sense of right so it's you know part it's it um it's it, the reader plays a part in the story and what you can make of it because there's a little there's a lot of um unresolved elements and occasionally he'll put things in there to titillate you with little footnotes you know there'll be an asterisk be a word mentioned in the dialogue or something and there'll be an asterisk and there'll be a footnote and the footnote um may not refer to another story in another comic book that you might like to pick up it might be a story arc that's not been resolved or mentioned yet it's kind of like if you think the when um star wars came out there was uh, a a rumor about the clone wars and nothing was said about it nothing was said about it <clears throat> wasn't discussed wasn't it was just proposed that there were clone wars it was a mention in you know in the story and uh and that created this secret you know a, a sense of of um interest in into well tell us more about this what does this mean um so it created a you know a hunger for um uh, more knowledge more information about it So it's the same thing with Hellboy there's a lot of elements in Hellboy that are um unres- either unresolved or touched upon 
in some small way, but not expanded on within the story itself. So it's it's a part of the again creation of the legend of the world of Hellboy. And um, he does this in all of his um, all of his characters. Uh, he, he'll he'll sort of allude to something that is unresolved, maybe in his imagine is his own imagination. It's an unresolved um, element that that he's yet to finalize. It's difficult um, getting a sense of. Um, uh, accuracy in in this um, this this looking over the glasses. Of course, your glasses are sort of dissecting it. You're dissecting your eyeball, so it's a bit difficult to um, manage sometimes. So a great thing with um, composition with Mike Mignola is the fact that uh, you get a lot of um, uh, story packed into these panels, but the story is not um, the story that unfolds in the narrative or in the dialogue. It's another story. So it's kind of... um, uh, a puzzle. It's like a yeah. It's like a game, like a puzzle. So I think this is part of his sense of humor, in a way, um, and his sense of um, his own his own sense of the characters. That it it is a game. It is a it is a puzzle. So um, and it, you can tell that he, you know he has a very intellectual spin. On the on the stories themselves, they, they're bigger than you think they are, much much bigger. In many ways, the films are uh, they kind of just dis- you know disappointing in many ways because they kind of touch on. I'm going to lighten this area. They kind of touch on the the um, mythology, but of course they can't resolve it. They can't they can't go into little side lanes of story. Um, because films work with an implicit form of storytelling. You sit back and you get all the information handed to you on a platter. A series would be better, probably, because you get more chance to expand within the the storytelling medium itself. Maybe that's something that uh, Netflix could, uh, or Amazon could explore and pick pick up the gauntlet. I challenge you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's something they can obviously uh, play with because they have more space in a in a TV show. But in a in a movie, there's a sense of uh, you know uh, like a storytelling method that has to be resolved uh, more completely than you than he would in a in a comic book. So some of the narratives are um, very incomplete. Uh, they're not resolved. They're kind of like, well, stalemate, and Hellboy walks away from the fight, you know, having uh, an unresolved issues, unresolved issues, and kind of, you know, um, both the world of both our world or Hellboy in our world or representative of our world, of our uh, humanity, I guess. The human. Um, he represents that, but he's kind of strong enough to withstand the the trials, the 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 um, the, the raw animal uh, nature of the of the of the spirit world. Um, which would uh, kill, you know, normal people. Like if you came upon a vampire or a werewolf, uh, 
you know, uh, he wouldn't fare as well as, as he did, as he would. Uh, you know, because he's, he's up to the, um, he's a lot stronger. And um, I like the, maybe just knock the shadows back a bit on that lip. Um, very important to th- look at the co- how contrasty elements are in a in the drawing. You know, sometimes uh, black can be very unforgiving and very non-warm. Um, remember, with the brown pencil, you have the 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 idea of creating a living pencil. So it's a living, breathing thing that you're trying to create, something that's warm to the touch, almost, of flesh, you know. Um, I've, uh, I've put this sort of graphic symbol of a crown above him because it's sort of part of his, his um, shtick <laughs> to use. He uses symbols quite a lot. And at first, when I first saw it, I, I, I was a bit puzzled by it. I was, why would you use a, obviously a graphic design tool to to decorate a panel you know when you're dealing with something that is action more action oriented or something you're trying to establish a, a believability in the world of the world now you momentarily take us out of that that uh, world that you've created by creating this artificial um, artificial looking uh, decoration yeah um, why would you do that? And the thing is, um, it's a it's a way of uh, of, of describing. I'm just going to close up some of these um, lines here. I'm going to bring back in. Uh, I need to, I need to reestablish the 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 battle lines here of light and dark. Okay. So I'm going to go back in there with a highlight later, but I just need to get some contrast in there. So the symbols are um, a very strange way of of um, decorating the frames, and they add a different narrative. They have a different form of narrative. It's not a different narrative. It's a different form, um, a different form of narrative. So um, akin to graphic design, so that you're reading things with symbols, meaning is changed from the implicit to the abstract. And that's kind of an interesting concept in itself for a comic. Never seen that before, you know. Obviously, we use symbols in comics like word balloons and, you know, explosions and all kinds of things, onomatopoeia. And so we, we obviously use symbols in the medium itself but not overtly in the pictorial sense to create a na- uh, you know a, a, a visual narrative um, that's part of this part of the story part of the universe so it's kind of like it's it's a very strange thing it's kind of like a momentary um, note uh, it's like a momentarily stepping out of the out of the comic or out of the panel and feeling the situation through just feeling the drama and um i've never seen that before it's it's unbelievably effective within the universe that he's created and again his investigative possibility, his investigative powers as a detective in the comic industry with his stories. Very, very flexible brain. Flexible brain. You know, um, incredibly powerful uh, storytelling method in the traditional sense and in the non-traditional sense. And this is what makes him special. And every bit as special as Kirby. And I know people are going to say, what? And he's, he's kind of like, he, he likes Kirby. Yeah, of course he does. But in many ways, he's a stronger 
storyteller than Kirby. And I'll tell you why. The sense of story that um, Mike Mignola tells you with these characters is something of the unfamiliar. Remember, this is, these are occult concepts, occult concepts, right? Which come from mythology and religion, etc., etc. And she's giving them in a comic book, which is a very, very short narrative, very short space, right? And even in his way of, of working in a comic book is even shorter because he, has a, he, he doesn't fill it with exposition. He doesn't have a lot of writing, you know? It's all very, very feeling. So it's very emotional. There's an emotional connection to the characters, and it's not just Hellboy. It's not just the, you know, it's also the bad guys. It's also the bad guys. You know, he started out with a very two-dimensional character, Rasputin as a baddie in the story, and filled it up with this incredible Nazi science, pseudoscience um, stuff, which is, you know, in itself fascinating. But the characters that he developed from that, after that, were incredibly deep. You know, their motivations are unclear a lot of the times, like the Baba Yaga, for example. And, you know, any other demons and stuff that, that he would introduce in the, in the space of the narrative. Like, you know, all of these, he would, he would dig into these mythologies and try to make them fit within the human experience of Hellboy. Hellboy represents us. Hellboy represents the human, the questioning human. We don't understand what's going on, but if you get in my way, I'll hit you. You know, if you try to hurt me, I'll hit you. Does I don't care how big you are, if you're a god or if you're a, a mon. You know, like you just don't hit monsters like this. You don't hit the devil. You know, he's too big. He's a god. He's a thing. He's a that. No. If he if he if he hurts my mates, if he hurts my friends, or or hits me, I'm going to hit back. Whether or not it'll, it'll work doesn't matter. But you know this this human quality of not taking things for granted, of not sort of standing on ceremony and saying, "Oh well, uh, okay, I, I give up. I can't fight against Nazis and you know Rasputin and." Or, you know, the, the undead and all this sort of stuff, we'll just give up. No, it's, it's incumbent upon you to try because that's part of the human experience, to try against it, all adversity. So this is a mark of a good hero, you know, uh, to, to keep trying, to keep that, that spark of, you know, belief in yourself alive. And a lot of the stories, a lot of the narratives are incredibly sad, you know. There's a sense of loss of, uh, of the natural world, uh, which, which the spirit beings and the elves and the, the, the creatures of the night, they often, rem they often reminisce about how it used to be. They often, rem you know, regret. They have a lot of regret and sadness about the ascent of man or what man has done to the natural world that they've that they're respectful of so it's a a very complex set of rules that he establishes with the stories and it's not something that we're not unappreciative of or unaware of because, you know, a lot of these myths and legends and things, they're, they're moral stories, after all. They, they're there to tell us servers like Aesop's fables, you know, uh, examples of um, our greed and what greed does and, you know, selfishness and all of this sort of stuff. Um, 
and in many respects this this the same evokes the same response so the lessons have something that we're familiar with from myths and legends and you know lessons in his comic fall in line with Aesop's fables they fall in line with the with the natural uh the lessons from the natural order you go against nature you go against mother nature this is what happens that sort of thing interestingly enough there there are no heroes in in hellboy in his writings um all of his writings and you know hellboy is not a hero hellboy is kind of a an, a reluctant player in these things in many ways and um i just building up the tone the three dimensional tone we'll talk more about that in a sec but the um and he does that with a lot of his his characters like uh um Lobster Johnson as well so kind of like a a a 1930s batman um so very uh very interesting um very interesting personality uh that that he has and um i think looking at these uh incredible uh sensitivity this the, the lines that i'm finding here is it's just evocative of a, of a very sensitive uh human very sensitive person so i'm finding that uh that el- the element of um mischief of course in the expression um but also a sense of uh he has a strong sense of self of his accomplishments very very aware of his world and to the extent that you know even if he wasn't a successful comic book artist he he would this would be his his area this would be his focus he would have created this world the hellboy world um irregardless do you get that it's that undeniable um life uh, affirming activity life affirming activity so i've softened a lot of these angles um simply because i think they're a little bit un sustainable ultimately in doing something that's ultimately organic so i'm just trying to sort of get a little bit of a handle on contrasting thick and thin lines here here and there yeah just here and there just helping out helping out a friend this is uh my version of a happy tree is a happy line so where bob ross would make um you know happy clouds and happy trees um i love happy lines happy lines to me are lines that you can see and they can bite into they're chunky you know this is my meat and potatoes that was clever wasn't it it was good it didn't go it didn't it didn't freak out it was a bit scary that long curve um it's a bit scary to do long uh brush lines but you know hey it worked yay yippee i'm going to fill this in too i think cuz I gave him a, a torn shirt for no reason. I just thought to give him a little bit of a hellboyish um uniform, you know, like a trench coat collar and and a torn black shirt, BPRD shirt or something like that. Be kind of fun. I like it. That's good. I like that. There's some nice um levels of light and dark happening in here. 
Um, Hellboy, I uh, actually use Hellboy as an example of um, of a film noir technique for um, a visual medium, visual sequential medium, um, because it's like film noir. It's an anti-hero. And um, it's a world of... Sh- you're creating a world which is dominated by the dark, dominated by the, the underworld, the dark world. And also in film noir, there's this sort of f- sense of truncated uh, language and story and narrative, which is, you know, it just adds to the mood, the sullenness of the topic of the of the uh, concepts I'm going to try and get some black into the background here um, let's see if I can use I'm trying to use a, a paint pen now bear with me it's going to be a bit glossy so it, it might flare up a little bit let's try and um, oh, I use the chisel tip thank you chisel tip now when I do blacks backgrounds like this black is a very unforgiving um, tone so it will eat up the, the lovely thick and thinness of the um, the, the pencil line and, and, and brush line which I've managed to build up with the um, with the contour around his uh, head so I'm not coming in directly into into contact. I'm going to try. I may not succeed. This is live. So um, <laughs> I may not succeed. I'm going to try to come in a little bit, but not touch it. So the effect is to give a, a like a cutout, in, like a kind of a, yeah, like cutting it out with a pair of scissors, right? And sticking it onto... A new grey background. That's the sort of thing to separate the foreground from the background in a more definitive way. I'll fill in some of that. So that's the theory behind this um, uh, process here. Oops, I can't see very well from this angle. Um, Gone a bit, uh, a little bit wonky, but that's all right. Let's go back into the chisel. Okay. Um, there's a quite an unpredictable quality to these paint pens, in that uh, the build-up of pigment tends to l- leave you with a uh, a texture, unwanted texture. So you have to kind of move carefully over the strokes that you've put in before in case you would um, partially reactivate the paint and get a, uh, an unwarranted um, texture where you don't want the texture. So this is not a Posca. I prefer Poscas. This is a... What is this? An iron lac. Mm, Sounds awful. Um, This is a bit glossy for my liking because um, glossiness in a drawing um, is a bit unpredictable, isn't it? A bit unpredictable. So that's kind of nice. Uh, we're going to get some white Posca. This is a Posca. I have them in different. I have them in different um, thicknesses. So what this does is giving the. Um, I'm going to put those shines back into his eyes. Oops. See what I mean with the. You have to be careful. Here I am.
That's better. Okay. Um, so I'm establishing a little bit of texture, a little bit of contrast with the the light and dark. So with the tone paper, you kind of meets you halfway with regards to the uh, imposition of light and shade to create a, a drawing that has a sense of three-dimensional form to it. i put a little shine on the metal there too. So this is something you have to take on board um, organically in a, in a way. Uh, messed up. I messed up. No, no. Let's get rid of some of that. Shine where I don't want it. Um, yeah. I'm going to try to get a thicker pen. Here we go. So, um, yeah, so it's just establishing a, a clear hierarchy of light to dark. And um, there is a, a, a method to um, creating a, like a, uh, a lighting effect that uh, complements the texture, right? And it just, you know, you need to look at the reference, obviously, and think about the direction of the light the intensity of the light accents here. And if there's anything you can do to help that that sense of contrast. Gonna lighten this. Here we go. So I'm just adding in the cross hatching and Things in there, I'm not coloring it in completely. So, um, highlights like this works best in small doses, very, very small doses. So, um, usually where the, the light sort of catches it incidentally, like at the edges of things, the edges of the nose, etc., etc. Um, I'll kind of put in a little bit of a returned light on the like a rim light from that direction just a little bit it didn't come out very well there did it it's sort of that's yeah, that'll, that'll do I guess I think it might be when do you know when to stop hmm, you just stop um, just one of those things I guess so you know, it's it's something that you can't keep going over and over and over. If you try to change the tone too much, you're going to lose the values, the differences between the light and the dark. So I might just... Um, I think I might just leave that there. How is this going for drying? It seems to be all right. So let's, uh, let's try to finish this... Um, Sometimes it's hard to, to get an opaqueness. Mignola. Um, I have to spell it in my head while I write it in case I make a mistake. Embolden some of these letters a little bit, going over them. Again, you know, the paint pen's nice. It uh, can build up on top of each other on top of the strokes underneath gives you a little bit more contrast to play with just to just a touch
I think that might be it. Uh, this is the before. And this is the after. And uh, this is um, Mike Mignola. Let's go over that letter again. You know, sort of an Art Deco style, perhaps. This is Mike Mignola, or Mignola, and the creative Hellboy. And um, this is Franz Cantor, and I will catch you on the flip side. Bye-bye. <laughs>